So good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak in English. <laughs> it makes my job a lot easier. Uh, before I start the presentation, I want to thank Professor Pansini for his introduction and for his advice as the center. And I want to thank Professor Yanming, Jiang Xiaoming, and Hui Yong Tao for taking time to be here today. Uh, I remember the last time I had a thesis defense like this as an undergrad in Iceland. Uh, I was a bit nervous just like now, and uh, it was a summer day like just like now. But it was one thing different. The main news in Iceland that everybody was talking about that day was that, that in the north they had found a polar bear. Mm. And uh, you might think, because I'm from Iceland, that that's a, something that happens every day, but no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> this happens maybe every every two decades or something like that. Just <laughs> uh, the one piece of the polar bear. Just one piece, but actually, uh, later that summer, the second one came. So what's happening? Everybody in Iceland is thinking something is changing in the north. Uh, everybody can feel that in Iceland. And a lot of strange things have been drifting from a new direction. Uh, not always a, a polar bears. Last summer, the news was filled with stories about another creature that came, a snow dragon, Xiaolong. <laughs> that's actually a Chinese boat, came from China across the uh, Arctic. And that's for the first time. You can imagine how much that, I just thought that was interesting. And uh, people can argue about the real impact of climate change, how big it is, and if it's man-made and all that, but North, the North Pole is melting. There's no arguing about that. Uh, what it means to the countries in the region, uh, that's not as clear, but I think it's really interesting. And I think it's interesting for a lot of reasons. And, and I think everybody that studies IR should think it's interesting because you have these huge superpowers like Russia and the United States are like the main actors there. And, you know, all geopolitical changes that affect them we can affect every like will affect the power balance in the world in a way. So and also under the ice cap we know there's a, a lot of resources that can matter, a lot of rare metals, a lot of fossil fuels and so on that people are going for. And the third aspect that's also really important is probably the um, potential for shipping over the uh, over the uh, Arctic. If the Arctic opens up for shipping, this will be a complete game changer in the way and will affect so much more than just Arctic countries. For instance, the, um, the time from going from uh, China to Europe by, by ship would almost go down by half. And in my opinion, this is incredibly important and can have very long term effects on everything, on globalization and so on. Uh, I think also it's a very interesting thing to study for me because there's a lot of material here to study. All these countries have strategies, brand new strategies. So nothing like I think in last four or five years, ten countries have made their new like made new strategies, like juicy books full of information about how they're gonna tackle this and so on. And for like an IR student like me, that's something that's very interesting to just dive into and try to assess. Uh, What's, what, what I think is most interesting aspect to this, maybe different from other kind of policies and, pol and international politics, is that it's all based on some kind of prediction, scientific prediction. And like we all know, scientific predictions are probabilistic. They are made, uh, they're not for sure. They don't even claim to be just for sure. But when you're making social policy or, or, or politics or whatever, a lot of times you have to kind of uh, hang yourself into one uh, scenario. And when you're trying to do that in social science, when you're trying to build a strategy or policy around some uh, future production or something, there is, a, in my opinion, obvious that it can be very fragile, it very easily breaks down, right? But at the same time, it can be differently fragile. Some can be less fragile than others, right? And I think this is a very interesting point of view to look at. Uh, 
something that is fragile is something that you have to handle with care. It's sensitive to volatility. If something happened that is different from the way it was designed to endure, it would break. Something that is robust is indifferent to volatility. Doesn't matter what will happen. Even if it's far from what it was designed, it will still endure. I also looked at the third concept that's not as common and has uh, been discussed a little bit lately by Nassim and Taleb, a social, social scientist. It's called anti-fragility. And I just, I just mentioned his name because I think it's very important that it's clear where I'm getting these ideas from. But I think it's a kind of obvious idea though, if you just think about it a little bit. Some ideas are anti-fragile in a way that if they're exposed to volatility or if something happened that it was not, not designed to do, they will become better. They're exactly the opposite of fragile. And it like sounds a little bit ridiculous, but if you think about it, a lot of, lot of good systems are like this. For instance, evolution or human innovation and so on. <clears throat> so, I want to use this fragility point of view to look at this. And that's the main thing that I'm trying to do in this, uh, in this paper. Uh, trying to analyze this and assess it from that point of view. What, I'm, I, what I don't want to do is trying to tell you guys what will happen in the future. Because that's something I'm a little bit against. I don't want, I don't want academics to do that a lot. Unless it's under some pretenses, you know. I'm, I'm, now I'm just predicting. Uh, I'm not going to tell you if there's going to be cooperation or, or collashes uh, or, or if there's going to be conflict or whatever in the future. I'm not even going to tell you if the strategies will be successful or not, because there's so many other factors. What I'm going to try to do is try to tell if it's fragile or not. Of course, there's a lot of other uh, aspects that will also affect the outcome eventually. You know, if you have a really big country and very powerful, but with a fragile strategy, well, like, maybe the strategy won't matter so much and just react differently. And so on. So, you know, like the economy of the country, the military power of the country, all that will matter in the end. But what I'm looking at is the strategy from this point of view. Uh, one of the key findings I looked, I, I to kind of use this, uh, use this method that I developed in the first part, part I, che I check out about 10 players and try it out and see how and get some kind of uh, results. Uh, one of my key findings was the United States strategy was a little bit fragile. The opening up of the Arctic can greatly update the world's capacity for globalization. And there's nothing in the strategy that prepares America for such a situation. And I feel like if there's any country in the world that had to think about that kind of stuff in their strategy, that would be America. So at least the public strategy that we have, I feel is fragile. Uh, on the other hand, use is neighbor to the north, Canada, as a strategy that I deemed fairly active fragile. The strategy achieves this through a clear plan to extract resources and, and, and then it handles like all the political intricacies of it with an emphasis on self-governing and devolution. So if you compare these key findings about these two countries, you can maybe a little bit, it reveals a little bit about the nature of my approach. And the United States is obviously a much more powerful state than Canada and widely more capable to project power in the north. At the same time, Canada is also made more like geographically dependent on the Arctic, much more so than the United States would be. Uh, but I'm not looking at those aspects, I'm looking at the strategies. And I think find like different kind of limitations to each strategy. Uh, the fragility of strategies of the Nordic countries, that's like all the little small countries where I come from. <laughs> Uh, I found was very different. It really depended on a lot of little, a little factors. You could not draw any big strokes to look at those. You have like countries like Greenland and, and Denmark that are in one union. And I found really active fragile. At the same time, I found like my country, Iceland, very small country, very dependent on the environment around it, have a very fragile strategy in the way it only looked at some upsets, ignored really big downsides. And then you have countries like Finland and, and, and Sweden that are actually don't have any land to, this, to the sea. So you know, like they have just very kind of low impact strategies that I just think are rather robust. Uh, interesting 
interesting countries to study was uh, was Russia and Norway. These are two countries that have really a lot to a lot to gain from this change in the class, this kind of climate change. And I found their strategy, both of those strategies fairly robust. And and the main finding here is that actually you would have thought that they should be anti fragile, right? Because they had the most to gain here. But actually, I think we find a lot of flaws in the strategy that I think takes down a little bit of uh, the benefit of it. Uh, and finally, I lo looked at two non-Arctic uh, non actors. I looked at the European Union and I looked at China. And I found the European Union to be kind of robust with the potential to be anti-fragile without being it. And I found China to be very anti-fragile in their approach. And which means that China's approach is a little bit more, like a little stronger than the European Union's. And I think what happened now in May, in when the, um, when the Arctic Council came together and uh, the, uh, China was chosen to be a permanent observer while the European, the European Union was denied it, for exactly the same reason as I talked about in the paper, kind of shows the power of looking at the uh, strategies in this kind of way. <clears throat> so I think you all have read my papers and probably have some questions, so please go ahead. So, thank you very much, and we'll start reading our comments and questions. Um, hold on. Yes. Hold on, please. Maybe I will start. Okay. I had the opportunity to be in office. What? Yes. In the last two years, um, 2010, I was in Arctic from Norway, and last year, I was there from Finland. Really? Yes. Yeah. And in Norway, mm -hmm. uh, two years ago, all United Nations uh, visits, not Chinese. Yeah. But in Norway, two years ago, I or we did see a polar bear. <laughs> so that's really something for us. Um, I think this is a, sort of a some wave of the future. If we talk about economic integration, globalization, all sorts of things. And see in that part of the world in the Arctic, people just started. Though you mentioned Russia, Canada, these uh, these uh, countries, these states, but in in the near future, I fully realize mankind, people all around, especially those concerned very much, deeply involved in thinking. How to create some new type of, you know, we call it new type of uh, major power relations, but that kind of new type of international cooperation, especially based on some of the ongoing projects like quite the jointly scientific activities to see the uh, Arctic area. Think about the climate change. Think about environmental issues. Think about those uh, protection or those uh, protectionist activities, uh, so on and so forth. How could people? This is very much against actually fragility. It's quite sort of uh, international cooperation based on these ongoing scientific um, programs, projects uh, sponsored by organizations like the United Nations and others, there are a lot. Even, even in China, we have sort of a northern reach to that kind of a circle. Our top northern spot from Inner Mongolia, called Gengze, a country. I was there five years ago and talked with the local people. You know, it's really fascinating. They wanted to join 
an international organization called International International Organization of uh, Train Training Beers. Shunlu. I never heard of it before I went there. Never heard of even that kind of a Shunlu, the, the, the training beers. There, there is some international organization composed by nine countries and the group of local Chinese Tajirs. They wanted to join because they saw their opportunities there. So, how do you think this uh, international co cooperation instead, uh, especially based on this ongoing, already started earlier, scientific joint projects, which already existed for some number of years? I personally know quite little about the Arctic and also the strategies of the countries concerned toward the Arctic area. Uh, I've never been to the Arctic. Uh, you I, so. <laughs> you would like it. Uh, well, I, uh, I spent one month uh, in Sweden, uh, yes. a country which is relatively close to the Arctic. Uh, and not a lot about the strategy of the country concerned toward the Arctic uh, areas uh, from the thesis. You mentioned in your thesis that there are four strategies. One is the fragile strategy, another is non fragile strategy. I'm, I'm still not so clear about the difference. Uh, between the two strategies. What do you mean by fragility? Uh, does it mean that uh, human intervention in Arctic means fra uh, fragility and non-human intervention in that area means non-fragility? So what is defined in that meaning of fragility? Uh, this is my question. Um, well, I, I think this is a very um, interesting topic, uh, although probably uh, not many people have uh, the, the knowledge of experience on the Arctic, but uh, uh, definitely it is the, uh, one of the uh, uh, promising Specific 
abilities. So my question is that uh, uh, Kiyom or Israel, Kiyom closes to your study. Uh, what, what are the main differences among these countries in terms of their capability in pursuing the Arctic, Arctic, Arctic strategies? Well, so you can take some time to prepare the Chance. Um, yes, first, let's deal 